Hi and welcome to yet another episode. Let me just zoom on in here. Now what we have here is a Roland SC55. Now I'm sure you're already aware of that because I'll put it in the title. But the thing is, this is a particular version. Now what I want to explain to you is that Roland decided over a period of time, um, basically within a year, they decided that the ROM version that was on in these machines was not good enough and they wanted to do something about it. Now the first version, version uh, 1.00 had a GS and then the word standard after it and then they had just a GS just like this one does and then they had a uh, over on this black bit they decided to put the GS and the general MIDI symbol and then they decided to have a uh, mark 2 which says it in yellow writing or orangey writing just here now what I'm going to talk about the different ROM versions for a little bit before I start talking about everything else is that the different ROM versions, depending on what was actually handed to game developers, um, sort of depends on how they bother to decide to write the games to for the music, because obviously they want the music to go out a certain way and they want it to sound a certain way. So what a majority of them did was go by the kit that their boss had bought them, which makes perfect sense. But the sad thing is, because Roland decided to change this, that and the other, over a period of time, even if you had written the music on, say, um, version 1 of the firmware, it might not play quite the same as it is on version 1.10 or version 1.21 or version 2. And the sad thing is as well though is that it wasn't backwards compatible either in the realms of if they didn't do it, um, if they moved a little bit away from the standard and did it just for this box, which would make perfect sense. I can see the logic why they did it. They get handed a very expensive box, they get told to write some music, they write some music they develop it for that particular box they've been given. But as I say, Roland, in their wisdom, decided to change this, that and the other. And it kind of screws things up a little bit for the game lovers out there. If you're just into playing just music and doing your own stuff, and you're not interested of sending out the MIDI file to people, what you want to do is just, here, here's a, an audio file, like an MP3 or the like, that's perfectly fine. But if you want to send people the MIDI file, it might be a little bit different, um, which, for the people that are into music, I'm sure they already know that between the different MIDI boxes. But don't you think it'd be a bit of a pain when you get told you've been sold an SC55 and then it turns out a mate of yours who works at some other company has an SC55, he goes to play it and it sounds different and he comes back with, no, that sounds rubbish. All well above and beyond what I can do with my skills, I can't play any musical instrument or anything like that, but that is the thing that I don't think Roland was taking mind of too much. Because as I say, I think they were just thought that people were going to make their own uh, recording, stick it on tape, records or whatever, and out it goes. Now, what's been decided by a complex conversations on certain websites and things, well before I even owned any MIDI devices myself, that the firmware or the ROM version for this particular device, the best one to have is version 1.21. Yet again, there's still sort of arguments of should he or shouldn't he, does it really matter? And personally, I think it probably does come down to is it a problem with the games that you actually want to play? Not games that are in a vast library of yesteryear games, but games you actually want to play um, versus even if it's on, like, not MS-DOS games at all, it's uh, X68000 machines instead. That's for you to do the research and for you to argue it out with and everything like that. Again, all I'm doing is going by, it's been decided that um, version 1.21 is probably the best one to have. Um, I managed to get hold of this box, which is a version 1.20. I knew I was ref roughly going for the correct one because I was looking at the logos on the front. But before I actually purchased it, what I did do is ask the seller to do a little trick you can do on the front panel to tell you what version of firmware it is on because the initial versions of um, these boxes used to be a sticker and it had uh, like three rows of um, zero to nine on it and then a little red dot on the different ones and from there you could tell which one it is. Here there's no sticker so there's definitely you need to be doing the little trick on the front panel. Now I'll explain the trick. First you stick some power into it and as those that already own one of these you'll know as soon as you stick power into it it turns the screen on 
but what you want to do is actually put the screen into standby and then you want to press the following four buttons the the two instrument buttons and the two MIDI channel uh, buttons all at the same time now it can be a bit of a fun game in itself to manage to do and as we can see here I've got version 1.20 it doesn't stay on for too long but it gives you enough time to read what version you've got now obviously as I'm sure you've already guessed and figured out with your Sherlock like mind I'm going to be doing a ROM update so what I'll do is get my new chip pullers or IC extractors whatever you want to call them I'll just line it up so I can actually see what I'm doing there we go it locked on and then screw this thing in I've only had these for well, a few hours quite frankly but what I like about them is that you don't have to concentrate so much about the squeezing of the, of the size you can just do it up well, at least that's the idea about them let's try again let's hope I don't bend any legs because this is irreplaceable quite frankly well not irreplaceable but irreplaceable as being the original there we go wasn't so difficult and probably made a bit of a hash of it for those that don't know I'm explaining but I realize most people do know if you're already watching this video that the chip to replace with you should always make sure that the notch or the little dot the original had a little dot there along with the way that the uh, chip holder actually has it's got a little notch there so I'm lining that up now as I'm trying to squeeze this into here and get another legs in the right places which nearly wasn't the chip to use for the programming chip is an EEPROM is a 27C020 or a 27C2001 now I'm actually using the 27C2001 so I could get my hands on I believe that's in there now just let me double check on the other side because obviously I don't want any bent legs or anything like that it seems to be fine Now before I plug it in to let's see if it works, one thing I do want to mention is that the the uh, coin battery that's here, that should definitely be replaced. If you haven't replaced it yourself then you should definitely replace it, even if you think someone else has done it already, you should replace it yourself just to be 100% sure because the old versions get very very cruddy. Now, the person I bought this off is a very good seller and everything like that but the one thing that they didn't do I didn't expect them to do is to open it up and have a look at the battery and as you can see the battery all that white stuff around the edge there is the battery leaking so it's not nice to be having that inside a device because obviously it could leak and ruin the PCB so all you do is there's a little tang just at the top you pull that back a little bit not huge amount of strength, just enough so the, the coin's got clearance to come out and then say with a, a plastic screwdriver or very delicately with a metal screwdriver ease the battery up from below, there's just enough room to do it and then obviously it slides out, remove it and stick in a new battery and the battery in question is a CR2032 that's a CR2032 standard battery really, if you're into computers you've been sticking them in motherboards for years um, but let's stick some power in the back of this with the, right, the correct power supply unit of course I don't want to do the wrong one there we go it's lit up again so I'll make sure I've got a bit of focus stick it into standby try to do this magic thing of pressing all three buttons at, sorry all four buttons at once there we go and I've got version 1.21 so from the great knowledge of the internet I supposedly have the best firmware to have and then a SC, a Roland SC55 um, for playing games with uh, MS-DOS games. So I hope you found that interesting. What I will do is uh, sort out my MIDI tower because obviously I've got to stick this into my MIDI tower as well. I'm going to 
get that going and in, in some oncoming videos I'll be showing the differences between the different MIDI devices that I have with different games, say like Monkey Island and whatnot. Not too long of it because obviously I don't want YouTube throwing a wobbly and I'm playing someone else's music but it will be from the computer games themselves. Um, just to give you an interest of what you could hopefully hear in the future is that I've got a Roland MT32 version 1 and then I've got a Roland CM64 it too can act like a uh, MT32 but it acts like the um, second version which there is slight differences as I said with Roland earlier on they seem to like changing what was actually happening with their devices without actually telling anybody um, then I have this one I suppose in the line of the Roland uh, lineup but then I also have a Roland SC55 Mark II then I have a Roland SC88 Pro and then I've got a Yamaha MU80 and if you're still listening I've got a Korg NS5R but I've also got stuck in that a Dream Blaster X2 which is great because it means basically it turns that uh, Korg NS5R into well other um, MIDI devices because I can actually flash it with um, different sound banks and it, it gives me a lot of uh, capability along the way. Um, people do ask of why do you bother to have so many different MIDI devices, um, especially since they know that I'm not, I can't play a keyboard or I, you know, I can't do anything with music really. I, I like listening to it, but I can't actually create my own. Um, well, the reason is is because, as I said, really, is that the the games developed over the years, and as they developed, they started using newer and newer um, box of chips. Really, they, you know, it was the the way that they they sounded at the time, and they used what was given to them, and they sort of expect you to have the same bit of kit. And if you don't have the same bit of kit, or at least something very close to it, you're not going to hear it the same way as the musician wanted you to hear it. Um, Obviously there's the whole thing of which amp are you using, which speakers are you using, and so on and so forth. I realise that's something but something that goes down a whole different line of uh, suck it and see, really. Um, it came, comes down to peripheral preference. I've got um, quite decent speakers that I like to play these on. So they're, they're computer speakers, but they're, they're sort of high up in the range of the Logitech range. Um, so that they... I enjoy playing modern games on them, so I don't see why I wouldn't enjoy playing the older style games on them because the the better speakers than maybe what they were back in the day um, for that sort of size, I suppose, because I've only got enough room for small speakers. But either way, though, what I've also got is a, a gadget that lets me um, send all the the MIDI sound to all the devices all at the same time, if I so wished. I don't really like turning them all at the same time. But then I've also got a, a changer that lets me skip in between them all. So hopefully that's put you some interest of hanging around and waiting for the next video so from the MIDI side of the videos that I want to do. But for now, happy gaming.